All right. Uh, hello and welcome, everyone. We're so thrilled to have you all with us this, this evening for the 2021 William Anthony Conservation Lecture. I'm Giselle Simon, the University Conservator at the University of Iowa Libraries. I'm delighted to be your host tonight. I come to you today from Iowa City, Iowa, where I both live and work. Because this event is being initiated here in Iowa City, I would like to show gratitude and respect to the Iowa, Meskwaki, and Sauk nations, and all other indigenous peoples who have in inhabited this place. Thank you. I would also like to take a moment to thank a few people who have assisted in tonight's presentation. I am in your debt. Sarah Jacob Meyer Pinkham, Candida Pagan, Chris Clark, Paul Soderdahl, and John Colshaw. At the University of Iowa Center for the Book, Julie Leonard, Director for Graduate Studies, is my co-host and dear colleague for this annual event. In conjunction with this lecture, Peter will be teaching a workshop for UICB students and UI conservation staff with, fun with funds provided by the Nadia Sophie Sealer Fund. The William Anthony Conservation Lecture Series invites book and paper conservators and bookbinders to share their experience and work with the University of Iowa Book Arts community and beyond. This year, we've gone far beyond. Um, so thank you all for participating in this new virtual format. This lecture is made possible by the William Anthony Conservation Fund, which was established in 1989 by a generous gift from James Fluke and Julie Scott. It honors our first UI library conservator and first bookbinding instructor, instructor at the University of Iowa Center for the Book, William Anthony. We are so grateful. If you have questions for Peter, please type them into the Q&A. Some of you have already found that at the bottom of your screen. And we'll get to as many of those as possible after the lecture. Um, closed captioning has been enabled. Now, I am so pleased to introduce Peter D. Verheyen, presenting Down the Rabbit Hole, Embracing Experience and Serendipity in a Life of Research, Binding Practice, and Publishing. Peter D. Verheyen started down this path as a work-study student in the conservation lab at the Johns Hopkins University's library, followed by a museum internship and formal apprenticeship in Germany and Switzerland. Returning to the US, he worked as a conservator in private practice and academic libraries, and also working as a librarian. His research interests focus on the German tradition in bookbinding, he is the translator of Ernst Collins, Der Pressbengel, and completed a bilingual history and bibliography of the Collins, W. Collin, Court Bookbinders, and Ernst Collin, the author of Pressbengel. Research is shared via his Pressbengel project, blog, and in other publications. He founded the Book Arts L. Listserv in 1994 and the Bone Folder e journal in 2004. Please welcome Peter Verheyen. Thank you, Giselle, for a wonderful introduction. And I'm really honored to be here um, and speak in this, in this series. So, pardon me, need to hit my stride. So, as Giselle mentioned in her introduction, um, I started out as a work study student and there we go. You know, it's, it's kind of the typical scenario. You go to college, you need a job. And when I was at Johns Hopkins, um, my father who was on the faculty said, the libraries hire a lot of people. And I don't know that you wanna be shelving books all day, but there's this person down in the basement and he runs a conservation book finding program and you might wanna to talk to him. At that time, I really, I was pre-law when I entered, I was a history major, I had other goals, but it seemed like a really good option. Um, and 
you know, it opened up a whole new world for me. My work was basically doing meatball surgery, circulating collections repair that will be familiar to, I'm pretty sure, a lot of the people in the audience. But the atmosphere that was created by John, and this is Martha, who was his number two and my primary supervisor for a lot of my time there, was really welcoming. And they put up a lot with, you know, with me. And but they also shared a lot. So there were workshops that would come in and the people who worked there, the apprentices in that program, but also the work study students, if they were interested, were really encouraged to attend, maybe not take part, but you know, you see. And so that really opened up a whole new world because of their generosity and um, you know, the resources that they made available to me, a work study student. So I was a, basically a semester ahead and I was really, I'd really enjoyed my work study job. Um, I was learning a lot. I was getting ahead of myself a lot. And this, you know, it's talking with people. It's like, okay, I can graduate early or I can do a semester abroad. And so this is the lab, the workshop in the Germanisches National Museum in Nuremberg. And I had been there once before when I was a very small child. And my father had written a book about the um, codex that you see on the left there. And so we had some, you know, we knew people and it's important to have relationships. So it wasn't totally out of the blue, but John Frank Maury, who was the conservator at the Folger said, you know, this is a really good opportunity if this is something that you're interested in to, you know, to experience it firsthand. You speak the language, you're not going to have any problems coming in because you know you have that other passport. And so wrote some letters and this internship came into being, it was three months. And during that time, I lived at a Catholic boarding house around the corner, also a new experience. And that boarding house was filled with apprentices who would come to Nuremberg for what they call block instruction. So you're in your shop, then three times, three weeks at a time, you come into trade school and that's where you live. And during that internship, it was really also an introduction to the trade traditions. Most of my time was spent I got to help on treatments that they were doing there, help with rebinding, doing some of the more basic work. But most of my time was really spent learning structures, basic book binding, box making. We made decorated papers. This is one of the boxes I made. This is one of my first little blank books. It's an Edelpappband and I'd marbled the paper as well. And these activities, they really, wet my appetite for more. And so, you know, you visit, it's a museum, so there's other conservation labs and you visit them. So the common questions were like, who are you? What are you doing here? Why? And you kind of explain, it's like, oh, okay. Um, and, you know, you start acquiring tools so that you can do a better job, you, you know, so you have your own, you're not relying on other people's, really bad habit to have. Um, I also visited some other binderies in the area just to get a different sense. And at the same time, I got my LSAT scores and it was pretty clear I wasn't gonna to go to law school anytime soon. And it, it really kind of, this could be an option. This, this could be a, a career, this could be a life. I really enjoy the work, why not? So this is 1984 and so there's no internet, there's no Google, there's no nothing. So how do you find out if you're going to apprentice where, you know, what are boundaries? who's there? I have family that were in different parts of West Germany. And so I looked in the phone books, which you go to the post office and they're all there and just start leafing through the yellow pages. Here's a bindery, here's a bindery, writing down names, numbers. Um, you know, basically working off of what's in those, those pages. And 
started writing letters by hand. They want handwritten um, application letters and handwritten resumes. I should have just photocopied those, but you never know. And so I got three offers to come and meet them. Most were like, can you come next week? And uh, no, I'm finishing up my college and I can come during exam period, which is in four weeks. And it's like, okay. So was able to book a flight, went over there, had three interviews and chose the one we'll meet next. So apprenticeship, it, it's kind of, you know, we use apprenticeship very casually around here in these parts and it's become more casual. But at the time in Germany, every trade was an apprenticeship. And if you wanted to go work in banking, it was an apprenticeship. Now we might get an MBA, now they'll get MBAs too. But, you know, it's, you're starting out at the bottom. It's a, it was a very rigid system. This is the image on the left is from a book, a booklet made to explain the bookbinding trade to potential apprentices. You can see the young apprentice probably left school. He looks a little young for eighth grade. But about that time, this is from 1934, I believe. And on the left, you, on the right, you see it says Schreinerei, which is a cabinet maker. The people outside are carrying signs saying, looking for an apprenticeship. And the boss is saying to the apprentice, you got any complaints? Can hire you off the street. That's flipped a little bit now. But the whole system was very, it's very rigid. And Sharing was considered optional. Everything was a trade secret. And even if they're documented in all the manuals, and one of the first things I learned was to steal with your eyes. You know, you're just looking around, you're taking note of things. And that's something that you'll find yourself doing throughout your life. So as an apprentice, you know, you're earning your chops, your building skills, and most of all, what you're learning to do is to work. This is the um, bindery where I served my apprenticeship, um, Buchbinderei Klein in Gelsenkirchen, which is right smack dab in the middle of the Ruhr Valley. For those who don't know, think of North Jersey or Gary, Indiana in Germany. Steel mills, refineries, coal mines, and lots of green spaces, very eclectic. All those industries for the most part are gone now. And the apprentices are fully integrated into the workflow. So you start out at the bottom. You have a lesson plan. That lesson plan is dictated by the national guilds. It outlines when you are to learn what, how much time you're to spend on it, and you are to keep a journal. A typical day, and you can see the piles out here. These are all journals that we bound for corporate libraries, doctor's offices, pub, some public libraries in the region. And, you know, we would be working in batches of about 100 books a week. My job, starting out at the bottom, you know, pulling staples, cutting, folding, gluing, sewing, making cases, sorting type. That was an interesting experience when the type drawers are emptied onto the bench. You have multiple sizes, multiple faces, and you have to sort them. Okay, so you learn how type is sorted and what the different faces are. Um, but it was work. And, you know, it's not something, you know, somebody who had gone to college, somebody who had come from a different country was not necessarily normal. Um, it wasn't abnormal, but there weren't a lot of us out there doing that. So there was a lot of getting used to each other on both sides. Mistakes, somebody says, you're gonna make lots of them, get them over with sooner rather than later. Um, these are two cartoons from um, Das Falzbein, which was an apprentice journal that was published um, from 1949 to 1960. It was the successor to um, the Buchbinder Lehrling, Bookbinding Apprentice, which ran from 1927 to 43. And that time span is really interesting. And 
you know, just kind of keep that in mind. But what you see here is the book is in cased in upside down and the, the master says, look, this is a whole, a totally new um, invention by my apprentice. The book is on the head so that you can still, you know, if you stand on your head, you can still read it. And the apprentice is kind of scratching his head. And the other thing is, you know, you really want to press those books so that the glue comes out or the ink. Um, and so, you know, nice view of apprenticeship. I was also discovered I was also discovering a lot of new materials. Um, parchment is my material, my the first love of materials. I love making paste papers. Um, but I was also discovering, you know, the literature to a greater extent. When I was in Nuremberg, I had gotten a few manuals. When I was serving my apprenticeship, they had actually a rather good library of manuals. And, you know, you kind of add to that yourself. And, but there wasn't really anything for apprentices anymore. And so all those journals that the cartoons came out of didn't exist anymore, they all ceased. And to me, that didn't really matter because I was very much living and working in the present. You know, I'm a sponge, I'm absorbing, I'm learning to be able to complete a task, to be able to do my job so that I can move up, you know, to the next step, and, um, but not really see, seeing the big picture, although there were hints and clues all around me. One of the things that is really important is taking risks and getting feedback. So in the old days, um, so when I was serving my apprenticeship, but going back to the 1920s, if not sooner, there were national apprentice competitions and you would enter for the year that you were in. It's a three-year apprenticeship system. So this was my first exhibit binding. Um, I can see a multitude of sins here, even without seeing the whole book. Um, and then, you know, you got feedback. These were the cards from the jurors. You know, is the book good? This one says, I might get a prize. I, you know, it was well-made overall impression is good. Um, but, you know, in other aspects, another one said the boards are too thick. Yeah, I know. Um, and I also trimmed it too tightly. But, you know, it's important to get that feedback. And the finer points, so you're in your apprenticeship, you're doing the work in your shop and apprentices are expected to go to trade school. And the finer points would be reinforced in trade school. And those would include more work with leather, parchment, you'd be doing edge treatments, um, tooling, you'd take machine courses. So we're talking about commercial industrial grade folding machines and two meter long board shears that were programmable and you'd be cutting it down to a postage stamp. The instructor would wave his fingers. He had a few stumps and say, don't reach in there. You would get the hint. Um, you also had to take math and social studies. The math was really basic, but I'd never done math like that before. You know, you have an edition of 10,000 books. This is the, the weight of the paper. You're going to be binding it with wire, a very German thing. Um, calculate the price and how long it's going to take and how many people you need, how much glue, um, that kind of thing. And the social studies were important. I mean, I grew up German. I grew up speaking the language. I was a history major. Modern European history, 20th century was my real interest, German specifically. There's a lot to unpack there. But a lot of what I learned was not how is the constitution organized? You know, what are your obligations as a citizen? How does the country work? And that's really important because traditionally apprentices left school and they still, you know, some still do, but like after eighth grade. So you need to have well-rounded people coming out of the trades. It's a holistic education. Um, 
So, and that was also reinforced in the bookbinding apprentice journals. I'm just going to try to. One second, I don't know what I'm doing here. Right. So you get spoken free at the end of your apprenticeship. It's called a Loge Special. And the analogy that I learned in, in, back in the States was, you know, it's kissing the bookbinder's daughter, which basically means the apprentice is blindfolded, gets their hopes up and gets a snoot full of paste. There was a celebratory end to the apprenticeship and at, at, that was after your exams. And, you know, part of that is because the apprenticeship was a contractual obligation. You, a, a, there was a contract, you had a lot of obligation and a few rights. Um, and one of the things that I was told, and it's true is, you know, you, you can show them that you're better than the results that you got on your final exam, which is on the right here. At that time, I was also still looking, I was gonna be going to Ascona for conservation studies, but I didn't really know exactly when I was returning to the US. I was still looking for internships and a lot of those were wildly optimistic like the Vatican. So I got this little postcard from the from Father Leonard Boyle, who was the director of the Vatican Library, basically saying, yeah, no, it's okay. There will be a lot of setbacks in life and like mistakes, try to get them over with sooner rather than later. So after your apprenticeship, you have journeyman years and in the trade that is three to five years and during that time, you're really, you have your tools and you work in different shops, learn different skills. Um, the exams are all the same across the country. So if you have, if you come to a shop, the master there will know, okay, you just finished. This is what you were tested on. Show us your pieces and, you know, get to work. You have your tools and you know, you do that. And so I, I wasn't doing that in Germany, but to a, a degree, when I came back, and I think we all do this, we have our journeyman period. I came back from Ascona and started working for myself because I, I, I needed to keep my skills going, but I was also applying for jobs. Where do you find job ads? You go to the Abbey newsletter, where's the Abbey newsletter? It's back at the library where I was a work study and people would feed me tips, which was very generous and helpful. And I ended up getting my first job after a few months of this at Monastery Hill Bindery in Hertzberg and Sons in Chicago. It was an old family trade bindery. They had an extra binding division. It's, I think 150 years already or close to it. And I was working there with Hank Kapensky Adam and as you know, developing greater skills, greater awareness of the field, but it's under supervision. And that's really important because when you're new, you don't really want to just hang out your shingle. You want to have someone there, even if you at the time you don't really think you need someone in retrospect, you want someone there to guide you to say, do you really want to be doing that that way? Um, one of the things that I worked into my contract with Monastery Hill was my three months at the Folger Shakespeare Library with Frank Mowry, which was an amazing time. And when I came back, it was not to Monastery Hill, but to work with Bill Minter. And, you know, looking back on my career and my work in the field, but working for Bill was really the best professional experience I ever had and to a degree I ever could have hoped for. And Bill was an apprentice, Bill Anthony's first apprentice. So it was in the English tradition and way of doing. And 
working with Bill, it was endless questions and questioning. That's, do you, do you know why you're doing what you're doing kind of thing? And that really, it made me think. And Bill and I, and, you know, I was very glad because that Bill was responsive to having the question flipped to him, um, you know, but it worked out and I really learned an incredible amount from him. But there were these different traditions. So you'd have these things in conversation. Oh, but you're German trained. It's like, yeah, okay, you're English trained. All we need now is a French trained binder and we can go to a bar and we can debate the universe. Um, but, you know, it was, it was really, it was the best experience. And also the range of work that we did was incredible. And, we had Chicago Handbook Binders, a community that sadly no longer exists. And this fantastic camaraderie in the, in, in the city, in, in the area. And it was just all around great. And it was with Bill that I also made my first trip to Iowa City. Bill was um, had cancer. And so Bill Minter wanted to go. And I had the fortunate, the fortune to go on two of his trips, if I recall. And I was also able to meet Tim Barrett and to see the paper lab there. And it was, for me, it was really, really eye-opening, especially the paper lab, but also meeting the person who Bill Minter really held in the absolute highest regard. Um, but after about three years, there was the call of benefits. And so, you know, working in a small shop like Bill's, that, that's really limited. So it was off to working in institutions for me. And so went to Yale and then Cornell where I was reunited with John Dean who had established a program there. And then I was able to establish a conservation lab at Syracuse University Library, which was for me the ultimate work study job because it also allowed me to get my library degree which I realized was incredibly important if you're gonna work in academic libraries, which is where most of the jobs are. So you have all these experiences, you have all this inspiration, you know, you, you exhibit, you go to workshops, maybe you teach workshops, Maybe you start writing some things, even if it's just your local binding group newsletter, you're developing relationships, hopefully sustaining them. You have mentors, but you may also find yourself mentoring. In my case, I also had some in special collections, which really helped shape how I approached a lot of what's to come this evening. You know, friendships and joint opportunities and all those things, if you don't burn bridges, which occasionally you do, really provide an incredible foundation for doing so much more. We have, when we do this, when we enter a field like this, we're fairly young and a career ahead of us. And that's a very long time. So I'm thankful to, um, Mary Sullivan, who's a 2014 UICB grad for this little quote down here. But like the book, what we do is a sum of its parts. We study it, the environment in which it was created. There's curiosity, the relationships, successes, failures, experimentation, and practice, not just in doing it over and over again, but the act of doing. And so in this next part, I'm kind of going to tie this all together by talking about three projects, which all started in 2013. And, but really, a, a lot of those past experiences, all those things started falling into place, a lot of context. It's like, oh, okay, I've seen this before. And so going forward, the first is Ernst Collin and his press bangle. So the book on the left is, that's just the regular trade edition, but that was a book that I first encountered when I was doing that first internship in 1984. And it's a charmingly pedantic 
or is it pedantically charming dialogue between a bibliophile and the bookbinder? The bibliophile goes to the bookbinder and says, I have these books I might want you to bind, but before I give you anything, I want you to tell me everything about your work, your trade, and what it is that you do. And I don't want to overwhelm you, but let's just do this over a couple of visits. So the book is, this dialogue goes on over six days. And on the seventh day, the bookbinder wept, had a drink, went to sleep, and needed to recover. But that book was meant to educate bibliophiles on what is, a, is you know, what is bookbinding? What is it that you should be looking for? The dedication was to the memory of my father. And, you know, it's pre-internet and my resources were kind of limited. And I really had no idea who this guy was, but I really, really loved the text. And so in 2008, I translated it into English. And uh, it was first published in the Guild of Book Workers Journal, but I also produced it in sheets that you could download and then bind yourself. And then in 2013, something happened. Um, but before we go there, so on the right, something I never hoped to find, but it's the deluxe edition, which was available in leather or parch uh, parchment. And there were only 30 copies and you know, serendipity, randomly looking for something else, found a copy. The rest is history. So in 2013, I got an email. Am I related? And I really didn't have any information, but I was really curious. There was the um, Presse Bengal was reprinted in 1984, in, and then in, there were some subsequent editions. But the introduction really was seriously lacking. Um, it had a birth date, which ha has stayed pretty steady. Um, it mentioned that Ernst Collin disappeared after 1933, which is kind of a convenient date. But it also mentioned that he was the son and grandson of Prussian and German court bookbinders. It mentioned two or three of his publications. So there were, you know, there were some clues, but there was also a national bibliography, which had a whole bunch of different information and different, slightly different dates. And so is there a doppelganger? And there was, because there's also an Ernst Colin Schoenfeld who wrote a book, but he had a whole bunch of different jobs and those two individuals, those two personalities were conflated. They had to be disambiguated to be able to answer that question. Um, so this is the apartment block where Ernst Cotton lived, first floor right here. Um, this is his book plate from something. There's no picture of him. And here we have from the Berlin City Directory, 1929, we have Ernst Bankbeamt, which means he worked in a bank. And Ernst Colin Schoenfeld worked as an archivist in a bank. And then here we have Ernst, editor at this address. And OK, so we have them both. And then going back and forth, I was able to trace them. And you know, it's really. Google, you know, had come about, but in 2008, it didn't really, the Google books didn't really exist. By 2013, it did. More and more collections were coming online. Um, city directories, for example, publications, serials, um, lots of things. So I was really glad to have, you know, access to those. Ernst Colin Schoenfeld's papers are conveniently held at the Leo Beck in New York City, and they're all digitized. So there was a bit a biography there, and it didn't really sound at all like my Ernst. And so, yes, Ernst 
was a relation of yours. At, he was the um, great, I guess, great uncle. Um, the person who contacted me, it was through her great grandmother's sister was married to Ernst Collins' father. Okay. So, you know, we had some clarity and some of the things that came out in that were in from an article in 1947, 1947, that Ernst Collin was Jewish, which made that 1933 date a little, well, a lot darker than it was when I first started thinking about it. Um, but it also going through that, his active period extended to 1936, perhaps a little bit further, but the politics basically were Jews were removed from public life totally. Um, and this that's before the Holocaust in terms of deportations and things got underway. But what we were able to do with the research that we had was um, place these so-called Stolperstein as stumbling stones in front of where he lived. And it basically has his name, his wife's name, the date that they were deported and where they ended up, which was Auschwitz. And to me, that was really, this was, and the family, this was really important because it's, it's a memorial. And this project, it's, it's incredible in that the idea behind it, I mean, it's conceptually brilliant, is you're basically, you're return, make, putting all these people whose lives were taken, you're putting them back where they chose to live you're mentioning their names, you have to, you know, you're bending over, you're reading it, their fate, and it's, it's a really incredible connection with them. But, you know, in the course of all that work, there was so much more that I learned and saw in terms of publication. So, to, you know, it's, it's time to take it to the next level. So, you know, it was to the memory of his father. Um, so his father was Georg Collin, Collin, but the firm's name was W. Collin, and they were court bookbinders beginning in the 1840s. And on the left here is one of um, Georg Collin's last bindings. He died on December 24th, 1918. And this book was published in the spring of 1918. And you know, it's it's just it's a it's a it's a fine press book. It's a beautiful book, but it's it's really nice to be able to have that. Looking through digital collections, this is Leipziger Straße, which was a really busy commercial strip in Berlin. And in the top, I was looking. I had an address. Um, Berlin was basically flat at the end of World War II, especially in the city center. But in this photograph from, um, I believe it was, you know, turn of the century, at the very top, you can see W. Cullen Court Bookbinder. And so here's a little ad, you know, founded in 1845, they did book bindings, um, they bound presentation documents, albums, folders, did cut leather, all sorts of different things. And it, that really, I mean, there's a lot there that I was finding and each one had the potential to lead me down another rabbit hole. So some of the other interesting things, this is 1918, the end of World War I. We call it the first total war, but all the industries were conscripted to support the war cause. And didn't matter whether it was Germany, France, England, same thing. And in this literature, there were references to all sorts of different things, to new techniques, but also to here's how we're coping with these material shortages. Here are new materials, new techniques that use less supplies. There was the human cost. You have all these people who are coming back missing limbs or worse. And on the left here, you see a bookbinder folding with a prosthesis. And there was a whole article, Ernst wrote one as well, but it wasn't illustrated. 
This one was from an article by Paul Adam, and who was another well-known author, writer, teacher in Germany at that time. The, the prosthetics that were plug and play. So you can plug in a bone folder or a finishing tool or a paring knife. I mean, it was absolutely mind blowing. You have on the right, you know, part of this being conscripted, what can bookbinders make? And the bookbinders trade includes framing, bookbinding, but working with leather. So this is a German military pack made in 1917 by W. Collin that I was able to, that I tripped over on eBay and it came to me from Lithuania. Um, but there were a lot of austerity measures and you know we'll come back to one of those a little bit later, but there was so, you know, the literature of that time, the journals were so rich that, you know, it's very hard to know where to stop. So Giselle mentioned this publication. It was something that I pulled together initially for the family, but it was also, it was a way for me to document everything. And if I'm doing it in English, but the audience for all this is in Germany, I might as well do it in German. And so I was glad I had my mother to help me edit it, but I pulled together everything that I had found and described, you know, was able to include bindings by the original W. Colin Wilhelm, then Georg, talk about the firm, talk about the state of book binding, chronicle the publications of Ernst, who was also an antiquarian. And then include his bibliography. And you know, initially, I was able to find 44 things, titles, and now it's over 370. Um, and I'm finding some of this work showing up in, for example, dealer listings, which is kind of neat. Um, but I also wanted this was I published this, self-published this, open access. You can download it if you really want. But it was also important to me to publish it a little bit more formally. And so this pat this year, I was able to publish an article in a public in a in a bibliophilic journal for the Pilkheimer, which is a Berlin-based German society, in their journal. And so that was really that was a, important because it was reintroducing Ernst and W. Collin, the whole family the binding to the audience, which they would have worked for in Germany during their times. I was also able to, I was asked by Don Rash and his boss dog press whether wanted to do fine press. And Don and I are good friends and it was an absolutely fantastic collaboration and the end result compared to the original text is monumental in size but it turned out really nicely and it's a little bit i guess more appropriate especially given the nature of the text than a journal article and find your own sheets and during the course of my research i discovered that it had originally been translated first translated into Czech in 1925, in, into Italian in 1996, and in, I believe it was 2014, no, 2015, it was translated into Japanese based on my English. So this text is getting around a little bit more, which is nice. The book is illustrated with photographs that were taken by John Hans Schiff in the late 20s at the Bremer Press. And these are um, large format cellulose nitrate negatives that were in really good condition. And Don had these. And this is kind of the perfect accompaniment. Um, Schiff's papers and photographs are also held at the Leo Beck. Schiff was able to emigrate in 1938. Um, 
And so the negatives made their way, way here. These are not held at the Leo Beck. And so we use them for this publication and they really give an, a, you know, a, a real look at this is how these books were bound for the Bremer Press, which was one of the most noted fine presses in Germany at that time. So while I was looking through all those things to find out more about Ernst, you know, I mentioned there's a lot there. One of the articles was about fish skin and I had used fish skin or in the past I'd referenced fish and fish as a material has been used fairly widely by cultures throughout the globe and it's experiencing a resurgence now and for to a very large extent in indigenous communities throughout the globe. And there's a real connection between the materials and those cultures. But fish skin for book binding was first mentioned, at least that I can find in 1708 in one of the first German binding manuals by Zeidla. and. The first modern application was from in a field kitchen in World War One Belgium. There was a bookbinder. Bookbinders were conscripted, a lot of them, and he was working in a field kitchen, looking at this lingcod and the skins. And it's like, why are we throwing these away? We can make parchment from it, and so it became kind of an austerity measure. Um, Paul Kirsten, who had worked with W. Collin and who had connections with the Royal Testing Institute in Berlin, had the materials tested in 1916, and the results were that it was incredibly strong. There were, in the interwar years, a lot of articles, a lot being relative, but a good number of them, including two by Ernst, talking about fish skin and how it can be used. And one of them featured Phipps, an apprentice in his third year who needed something special for his apprentice competition. And so he went to the fishmonger, asked for the biggest, fattest eel they could find, and he just wanted the skin. He didn't want the meat, he didn't want the guts, just the skin. Fishmonger's wife looked at him, uh-huh, and he got what he needed, went into the courtyard of the shop, started cleaning the skins, disgusted everybody, and um, bound his book. So here you can see him pinning them out on a board and letting the sun do the rest. So this is um, one of my, I guess this is the first book that I did with fish referencing it. It's Opus Sal Salvelina, Salvios by Ladislav Hanka, who is a printer and engraver in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And this is from the exhibition 50 by 25, where 25 of us got to buy in two copies of a text. There were, I think, four or five of, there are five of them. And um, this is about the life cycle of the trout. And so this was my binding, it's veiny calf, and it kind of references the fish swimming through the roots and things in the water. It's a, this is a skeleton, but it's making use of the translucent properties of the parchment. This was Mayflies by Gaylord Chanelec, which I bound for designer bookbinders um, exhibit that toured. And I'm using salmon leather here. It was a commercial skin and I really wasn't thinking about it. It was just a material. It seemed appropriate material as metaphor as Richard Minsky would say, um, the artwork is under the parchment. This is just goat, um, but you can see the translucency again. And then there's a fly, but you know, if Phipps can do it, I can do it. And so I decided to start playing with my food. And first time around my wife um, brought home a very nice salmon filet and new, full well what I was going to do with it, was goading me on. And so I skinned it. And this is Arctic char, which I did more recently. This was um, from a few years ago. And you can see the skin is still wet and it becomes much more translucent. Um, 
part of my learning, I reached out to Jesse Meyer, who was able to provide a few tips, but had never done it himself. And again, thinking back on FIPS, why not? A few years later, as I was, I was working on an article on fish skin and binding, and I reached out to Tim Barrett. Tim, thank you very much. And basically what he did was run some of my salmon through two of the same tests, kind of, that would have been used in 1916. And I say kind of because we don't really know exactly how thick the fish skin was, for example. It just said folding and tear strength, but what kind of machine, those things matter. But Tim tested it and his, the parchment in the fold test maxed out at 79,000 and change folds. It's pretty impressive. It didn't tear all the way through. That's really impressive. And here you can see goat at 12,000. And then the, um, the PC4, the UICB flax paper, which is, we all use it as a stand-in for parchment when we make our limp bindings, you know, with 4,500 folds. So, you know, this was some serious strength. And I'm really happy to say that um, as a result of something I'll describe in a moment, that a book conservation student at West Dean ended up doing her research, her thesis project on fish skin and strength. And so I'd be really interested to see how, what she found out and learn more. So I did a lot of fish skin. You go to the supermarket, we, I call it Wegmans Creek, and they have a very good fish counter. And so have Atlantic salmon, Arctic char, some haddock, some snapper, mackerel. And I call this my aquarium. And that's something I got from Aaron Fletcher. And it kind of stuck. I like it. It's a lot easier. You don't have to change the water and things like that. And you don't have to feed them. Um, these are. This is one of my recent bindings using um, rainbow trout. It's a river runs through it. And you can see how translucent the trout got. And underneath it is, this, these are USGS maps. The author of River Runs Through It also worked for the Forest Service. This is the river. These are the rivers that he would have fished with Missoula over here on the left-hand side. And, you know, I added, reference the process I used to make the parchment by, with these brass tacks along the margins, the way I would have stretched it out. Um, old Man in the Sea. Um, swordfish are kind of big, hard to get. So mackerel it was. And the mackerel, you can, the skin is very, very delicate. Salmon is almost indestructible. I sewed the book on shark skin thongs. The shark ate the swordfish. You can see some of the scars there, um, but a lot of references to the text. But you know, the mackerel worked out really well for that. Again, you know, some of that material is metaphor. Thank you, Richard. Um, and then this book, Life History and Habits of Salmon, Sea Trout, etc that I bound in this year, the spring, but the book itself is from 1910. And so in addition to tapping into my aquarium, I'd also taken some tanning, a tanning workshop with Janie Chang, who has really been incredibly active over the past year or so, teaching fish skin tanning workshops of all different kinds. And so this is, ah, sorry steelhead that was tanned in green tea and you know you get the lateral line straight you can use it as a design element here it is in the salmon not so straight this is arctic char and this is kind of a it's a walleye skin and so these are illustrations from the book but they're underneath this fish of whose skin is on the binding 
and it was sewn on salmon parchment and then one of the other fish skin binders in Scotland, a Gloria Conti, sent me a sample of her oil tan salmon. And so I used that for the rondelles. But all these things are a lot more fun when you do it with others. And back in the day, fish skin binding really never took off. There was an article in the, a rep, short article in the 1960, the last volume of the fight spine, which basically said, yeah, you know, there's fish skin, you can try it out, you might find uses for it in fancy little boxes, but go ahead, indulge yourself, try it out, move on, use real leather. And I think at that time, there was also a sense of we need to get all this austerity behind us, forget it, push it into the back, like a lot of other things. Um, so i had been sharing my adventures in fish skin binding on my blog, and list serves from time to time, other places, some people intrigued, some utterly grossed out, but I was put up to, well, why don't you do a webinar? This was just as COVID had started, and this was in, I think, the end of March, beginning of April. So I did a little pop-up webinar and had more people sit in than I thought would, a lot more, and we got together and I decided to do a binderama. Now the binderamas are something that I did for when I was um, publishing the bone folder. And so basically it's an unjuried exhibit. And in this case, it was, you have to prepare your own skin and then you have to make something with it. So you can see that and there's a link to it, but Two of the binders, Karen Hanmer and Kyle Clark, who participated in this, also have bindings in the in fish skin in the current guild exhibit. And more people are getting into it. And so last rabbit hole is the or bradle, as I call it, the pup bunt. And that's the topic of tomorrow's workshop. And this structure is foundational for so many of the modern structures that we use now. Um, and so the ones that I've taught, certainly in the German tradition, but the case binding. And there's a lot of creation myths around it. The German, French, you ask different people in different countries, what does it mean to you, What the structure? And you get wildly different answers, even within the same binding tradition. Um, so I've been asked, it's something, I prefer the 20th century, first half of the 20th century. This is not my comfort zone, but I used my references to translate things for colleagues. And so I was familiar with the sources. And so what I did was go all the way back to, which happens to be Seidler in 1708, and trace the evolution of this structure through the bookbinding manuals. And there have been articles about this structure, about paper bindings. And one of them was actually written by Gary Frost, which was really helpful. And, but most of those are based on observation. And there's a lot that you can get from observation. You really wanna do both, but when you're trying to figure out where did this come from, which was the question when we were talking, Giselle and I were talking about, along with um, Julia Leonard, about what's the, the workshop topic. Well, where does it come from? What are the origins? You really wanna go back into that literature. So, it also turns out that this was the first structure that I learned. And this is, you're basically, you're building the book up on the text block. The boards aren't laced through. Um, please ignore the really, really dark hide glue on the side that was very well burnt. Um, hide glue doesn't have to be that way. It took me some time to learn that. But this was the first structure that I learned. These are from 1984. It was also the focus of my teaching and these diagrams from some of the things I've written kind of show some of the key elements. So you have a spine stiffener that goes around the spine and gets attached and then you attach the boards to that. There's a waste sheet. This is my uh, journeyman Fritz who is fanning out the cords. And 
So in the articles that I've written, I've written about the more modern interpretations of the case binding, but also where it's like a three-piece binding, the same structure is used for parchment bindings. And there's a lot of, a lot of variation to it. It offers huge um, flexibility. Where's my... So for me, you know, there were no aha moments in the literature at all. And so for this workshop, we're just gonna go back to the roots and we're gonna explore and talk about how it evolved as the students make one. Um, the structure, as I mentioned earlier, also existed in other traditions. Bradell is French. Um, we're not really sure where he learned it. Some say Germany, some say that Bradell was German. French National Library has completely different things, um, but you also have in the Danish tradition, you have the Rubo binding, which the Germans call Edelpappband. There's also a Danish millimeter, which takes elements of this. In the French, you have the simplified bindings. And um, Karen Hanmer, and I forget who, um, an English binder wrote the manual, but she's been adapting a technique that she learned there to an even more simplified version, but they all kind of go back to this. So we're gonna close the circle and, you know, all these things really, they tie together, they connect, they relate. And you don't always see those connections when they're happening or early on, especially in a career. But over time, sometimes all it takes is a spark, all it takes is a, a catalyst, and then it just really goes. Um, and, you know, thinking about my career and thinking about the work that we do, you know, if you're working with these kinds of materials, it's something that you conscientiously chose. And a career is a really, really long time, as I'm realizing now. Um, I've realized it for a while. But, you know, so you need to have things that sustain you, that nurture you, that inspire you. And, you know, that's really the most important thing. And you can give back, you can teach, you can mentor. But find your rabbit holes, find that thing that really excites you. So I'll open it up for questions now, but you know, I have some parting thoughts and I'll leave that up for a minute or two. I'm not gonna read it, but let's have, see what's in the questions.